Hello again, everyone, and welcome to The Crusher. I'm your host, Josh Brewster, with my lovely and talented co-host, Susan Olson. Susan, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And I hope you're well, too. I'm doing well. I know you were away in St. Louis for a few days. Did you have some some Brady-related matters to attend to? Is that... No, uh, not really. I was doing a, a convention. Okay. And, yeah. Excellent. You have a good time? Um, good time because there were good people there. It was a terrible convention. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I'll hope for better ones in the near future. But, hey, at least they're calling, right? All right. Uh, our guest today, I am very excited about this. Uh, this is a very, it's a dreadfully serious issue, folks. And it's something that I've wanted to talk about for a long time. And we have touched on this on the show. But my guest today is Dr. Robert Marbot. Uh, he uh, served under President George Herbert Walker Bush number 41, President 41. He's a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute, and he is a producer of this very interesting new film that you need to go find immediately. I watched it today. It's called Fentanyl Death Incorporated. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you uh, very much for having me. Honor to be on with you two. Well, we're, we're on to have you. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead, Susan. No, I'm just saying it's an honor to have you. I, I love the extensive research you've done. I love how thorough you've been. Um, I really didn't know that this had been going on for quite as long as it has been. And I think I think every every American needs to know how completely different the fentanyl crisis is. Oh, it, it, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, folks, um, you know, you know, we talk a lot of politics on the show, but this is uh, impacting everyone of every persuasion, every race, creed and color. And this is a true crisis in this country. Uh, the director of the film is Mr. Stephen Woolworth. So I should uh, I should point that out. And I'll, I'll start out with a factoid here, and then I'm going to ask uh, Robert about what, the background of fentanyl, what fentanyl is. Uh, but here's a factoid from the film. Over the past five years, more Americans have died from fentanyl than have died in combat during all wars combined from 1939 to present, which means, of course, that includes World War II. So, Robert, why don't you tell us what is fentanyl? Fentanyl in is a in scientific terms is called a opioid. It's in the opioid family, but instead of being the organic opioids from the poppies, it is synthetic. And so it was created in 1959 and and it's it, and when properly used it's critical. Basically, open heart surgery, as we understand it now, could not be done without fentanyl. And there are a couple other surgeries, but that's really different than the illicit fentanyl you get on the street. Totally different night and day. Well, in, indeed. So right now, what has, what has transpired in... Now, Robert, I'm going to peg this a phenomenon of the last two decades. You can correct me, okay? But what I perceive happening here is w- w- you have a situation where this drug, synthetic drug, is synthesized and ultimately it's, it's put into people's recreational drugs or people buy pills on online or something that's not at a pharmacy and it's in there there's so there's but there's also the there's the deliberate use of fentanyl you point this out in the film there's dealers who spike your recreational drugs with fentanyl then there's also situations where dealers and users don't know that it's spiked and then there's this stuff is so heinous that children children or other people or even cops can be poisoned by it just by drugs that are around. I know cops are concerned because it's so potent. And and you point out, and, and I promise I'll shut up here, but you point out in the film, and a lot of people have heard, that uh, basically the equivalent of two grains of salt worth of fentanyl can kill you. And three will kill anybody. You know, two, you might live. 
maybe, maybe not, but three will kill you. Think about that. Three grains of salt equivalent or one fifteenth the size of a rice kernel. That's, that's what we're talking about. That's why we've never seen a synthetic drug this dangerous, this lethal ever in the history of the world. And, and as Susan was saying, this is different. This is a really different thing. This is not meth. This is not Coke. This is not crack or K2 or spice or angel dust or PCP. This is a real different deal. And for the last 20 years, all overdoses of all types of drugs, like every drug out there illicit, was running about 20,000 a year deaths. When fentanyl comes on and really spikes about six years ago and just really takes off, and there's some reasons why that happens, but when it takes off, we're now well over 125,000 deaths of all types, of all four of those categories you mentioned, you know, recreational, spiked poison, lace trace. And the saddest is these kids, right now fentanyl's killing in many states is the fastest growing death rate of zero to four. Think about this. Children zero to four are getting poisoned to death because fentanyl is so powerful. If you leave it on a park bench, if you leave it on a counter and you put your sandwich down and pick it up, you got your two grains of salt. And for a little kid, you, uh, one grain of salt can, can, can do you in. And so it is, it, this is an insidious drug. And, and there's a lot of reasons why we got here. But now the question is, what do we do now that we're here? So uh, let's start in China. Uh, we have, there's a couple things. We have Mexico to our southern border, which is a whole big part of this. But China, some people say, Robert, that China is at war with the United States now, and they will not fire a shot. And what we are seeing is that the precursor, the the chemicals, uh, pill presses, things of this nature, are coming from China, being synthesized in in a number of places, but 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 in Mexico in a very important way. Now, there's a whole lot to break down here, but this is really serious business. So let's let's talk about China being at war with this country, mm-hmm. flooding this country with fentanyl. People in places like Manzanillo, I think they pronounce it, in, in, in Mexico, thousands of Chinese nationals working to help synthesize this. The Mexican drug cartels using this to their advantage, moving off of other drugs and putting getting involved in fentanyl. So let's talk about China and Mexico for a few minutes. So, and, and let's hit the whole supply, the supply chain coming in, because let, let's Thank talk you. about that. And it, the, the first wave of fentanyl that we understand now, there's a direct tie from Purdue Pharma to the Mexican cartels in China. And everybody goes, how do you get there? Well, it's Purdue Pharma, as you may remember, was putting out, they jumped from organic opioids to synthetic, which, by the way, is 100 times more powerful than morphine. And they were telling everybody, this is non-addictive, that's why you can use it, and all that, and then had all the doctors prescribing and all the uh, pharmacies putting it out and such. And then everybody figured out, hey, that was not, that was, is very addictive, very dangerous, and then all the lawsuits and all that. Instead of the United States getting really focused about how do you deal with millions of people addicted to all the different things, Purdue Pharma, you know, Percocet, uh, Oxycodone, all, you know, all the synthetic family, they come in different names. Instead of us working on treatment, we didn't do anything about it. And so the Mexican cartel and one guy in particular from China goes down to the Mexican cartels and says, look, we got these people addicted already in the United States. Their drug supply is drying up. It, remember, it went fast after the first lawsuits. It goes real quick. And so all these people are addicted. And in, even though they're insidious, horrible people, they are great business people. 
I mean, it, we, we got to understand their business is sophisticated. They already had an addicted group and they said, we can fill the supply. So China initially starts by making the full product. They made the precursors, the pre-precursors. They actually pressed them in pills. They got them to the cartels and said, will you distribute it for us? That was the original, and that's really only in the 2012, 2014 range. It really comes that fast. And then um, as people start getting really tighter with China, and I mean, the interdiction of the supply, China started realizing they would get just as much money by sending the precursors over and the pre-precursors over and let the assembly or the manufacture occur in Mexico. So the pills that were originally coming straight from China now come straight from Mexico and they get made there, pressed, mixed and all that with the agents that come from China. And then what a lot of people are not aware of is now Canada has gotten into it. Canada is the number one distributor of fentanyl into New Zealand, into Australia because it's part of the UK. So things don't get checked as much. And China's realized they could send the precursors and the pre-precursors up to, uh, up to Canada and get done by the biker gangs up there. They've just, while we were filming, just in the last six months of filming, there were 20 super labs taken down in the western part of Canada. And a super lab is generally defined as uh, you can make a million pills. And so think about a million fentanyl pills. And, and the biggest drug bust ever in Canadian history was uh, two weeks ago, ever. And so China is said, well, whether it comes from Mexico or, or Canada, they don't really care because they make their money and it's doing the destruction of the population. You know, it is killing us with it. There, this is the biggest accidental threat I think we've had since uh, World War II in our country. I, I firmly believe that. Well, I'll tell you what, and I'm going to turn it over to Susan, but uh, when you stop and think about this, uh, you hear about a lot of, uh, of ODs. I hear people talk about o ODs, and, and a lot of the times these days, the, these are not ODs. These are poisonings. Someone <laughs> intended to take something else, and they ended up with something that had fentanyl, and of course, now you hear about Narconon and all, all this other stuff, but uh, boy, Susan, this is another level of insanity we're facing here, Susan. Well, I mean, yeah, hey, I grew up in the 70s. I enjoyed my drugs. Um, and, I mean, you know, today somebody, like there, there was a young girl who, she got some Coke. You know, they're, they're, maybe they were going to prom. I know we got it at my prom. Um, and, and, you know, one or two grains of fentanyl can be in cocaine. And while okay, it's not it's not good. It's not safe to do any drugs, but you know, young it's not people likely do to kill these you. things. Yeah. yeah, it's not likely and, to and, kill you. Right? Exactly. I mean, you, you know, you, you you try something, but with this, I mean, you can try just the tiniest bit, and it can kill you. And I've heard that in some cases. Well, particularly, let's say you're doing coke. Nobody's expecting it to be laced with an opiate like this. So, I mean, nobody's even going to think about Narcon. And, and I've it, heard that Narcon doesn't work all the time. It, it, and let's, you're, you're hitting a couple things. Part of it is the drug dealers. And let's go back to the cartels, uh, whether it's the cartels in Mexico or the biker gangs up in Canada. They, they are making, the, the Mexican cartels have several vertical businesses. This is a business conglomerate. They're doing sex trafficking. They're doing human trafficking. They're doing coyote to take your services to get you across the border. They're doing all illicit drugs. And now they're doing fentanyl. And fentanyl's a big package. And we can talk about border. I'm sure we'll get to that. But when you look at, at the how this distribution works, you know, how they're they're marketing it to it. There are drugs that let, let's pretend like we did fentanyl on Wednesday night. We made it on a table, you know, whether it's down in Mexico or biker gang or, or down the street and you got fentanyl dust on the table. Nobody, this, these are not white clean labs where they clean everything up that we have pictures in Mexico 
where they're doing making meth in the background and fentanyl in the foreground, and it and it just gets cross contaminated, and so it this dust is on there, and so say tonight we do uh, weed or coke or crack or whatever, people are now dying with weed, and it was yes. because fentanyl was made the night before, and the dust never was cleaned up, and you you're dying, and so there are deaths where the dealer doesn't know there's fentanyl in it, and the user doesn't know there's fentanyl in it. That's how insidious this has become. And, and, and there is absolutely, especially on the West Coast, people who are fentanyl addicts who are specifically looking for fentanyl, think San Francisco, Seattle, Portland. But when you get to other parts of the country, they're like, I don't want fentanyl, but fentanyl comes, it, it's like, I think 70, but last thing I saw from DEA is 70% of all illicit drugs have some level of fentanyl in it. Maybe not a lethal dose, but some to decide the cross contamination. Then you have the group like Kensington up in Philadelphia, which is purposely mixing 30% tranquilizer, horse tranquilizer. Because think about, yeah. yeah, think about horse tranquilizer for a 1,200 pound horse. You know, a 200 pound person is going to do 30% trank, 70% fentanyl, and d- do them together. And this has gotten just nuts. And, and sometimes you know what you're getting. But most of the time, you have no earthly idea what you're getting. So, well, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, in the film, you go into the uh, the fentanyl fold. They, I think they showed some people in, in Philadelphia. They're, they're doubled over uh, with this horse tranquilizer mixed with fentanyl. And, and it, uh, evidently, uh, Narcan or Narcanon, whatever they call it, it doesn't work on a drug like that. And I'll tell you something personal, okay? I will get personal. I don't drink, okay? I, I know what it means to not to not use anymore. Okay. I I don't drink. I cannot tell you, and this is all anonymous. I'm not going to mention names. I, I, you have no idea how many people at an AA meeting will get up and say, I was on fentanyl or this one died and this one died and this one died and this one died and didn't mean to take it. Didn't mean to take, didn't intend to take fentanyl. They're dead. They're dead. You didn't hear this 20 years ago at the AA meeting. You, you didn't hear it. You no, just didn't it, hear it. And yeah. by the way, there's a group called Families Against Fentanyl that I should mention because it's a heartbreaker in the film. When the film starts, I'm not going to give it away, but boy, it's a heartbreaker at the beginning. And this was a real smart beginning to your film was when you interview the woman whose kid is just, kid's gone. The, you in know, Arkansas. the kid is gone. It, it's horrible. It's a horror and, show. And, and, and that you know, and again, I don't want to give too much away, but we're talking about when, when we, I met her in Washington, D.C., we interviewed a bunch of people and then I, you know, who's good on TV, who has a compelling story. And then when I uh, told our director, I said, I think I got six or seven to look at. So he looked at our, our tape and he goes, I really want to interview this Stacey James person. And and where is she? And and we're like central uh, central Arkansas. You can't get much more rural in Middle America. And then when we go there, she says, "I'm located in Yaleville, Arkansas, which is 1178, 1178 people." And when we get there, we find out she's actually outside the town, you, you know. And so she, it, it, this, if it can happen in Yaleville, Arkansas. And we know it's happening in San Francisco. We know it's happening in New York and Miami and Chicago. This has gone everywhere. And when I started just sort of working on the fentanyl only issue about five or six years ago, it was really only on the coast. It was basically Seattle to San Diego, a little bit in Hawaii, uh, and then the DC to New York, Boston corridor. That was it. Now it's everywhere. It is everywhere now. Indeed. Susan, did you want to continue? Well, you know, it, it's difficult for me because this this has been a game changer. Um, I, I was always in favor of, you know, as a libertarian, you know, make all drugs legal, but make treatment very available, um, you know, treat people rather than incarcerating them. I was a big believer in harm reduction. and. Um, 
you know, it, it's questionable how much these things worked to begin with. Now they're out the window. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, you know, I was very much against the uh, war on opiates because now if, if you get oral surgery, you get anything done, nobody gives you anything. You don't go home with the Vicodin. You go home with um, Tylenol. And, and it's like, well, that's not fair either because there are pe- you know, yeah. people that need pain medications. But I just want to say personally, I know of three people that because of the war on opioids, and this was you know, like 15 years ago, this is before the fentanyl got so bad, um, because they couldn't get their, their pain relievers, their prescriptions filled, they switched over to heroin, to smoking heroin. And now, you know, yes, that's dangerous as it is, but now it's incredibly dangerous because it may have fentanyl. And I do know one person that died from that. Well, let me let me say this before I get back to Robert. I you know, I was never a big fan of 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 the drug war in that I didn't believe in mandatory minimum sentences for possession cases. But I got to tell you something, and it's not just me getting old. This is this methamphetamine into now fentanyl, all this synthetic stuff and this fentanyl is just killing people. Um, there's people who need to be locked up and I'm a big believer in incarceration now. Now, I'm not talking about for the, for an addict, some addict but and I guess we'll get it. Well, we might as well get into it now, Robert. This country, this country it treats mental illness with incarceration, and this country treats mental illness by letting people sleep in tents. We live in Los Angeles here, Susan and I. You see how messed up we are, Robert. You talk a lot about in your film about treatment, and again, I want to say something. I really firmly believe if you're throwing fentanyl into people's drugs. You need to go to prison, okay? But there, but we we we've we've lost our minds when it comes to mental health. We tense. We have tense. We, you can't, Robert. We, yeah. We're bonkers, Robert. So let, let's break break this into two two groups: people that are wholesale suppliers or large retail suppliers. They absolutely have to be prosecuted. And in, in this whole idea of decriminalizing fentanyl, the most dangerous drug ever, you wouldn't decriminalize uh, other really high-end drugs. So why were we doing that? So we got to recriminalize that for the distributor or wholesaler type. And, and you're right. You got to lock them Agreed. up. Agreed. Now, Agreed. for the user, locking them up is useless. You, you, it won't work. It'll make things <laughs> worse. We have to get treatment, and and I have a mantra, and, and it really it really is a mantra. And this came out of my work in the homelessness world, and when I was the homelessness czar at the White House, is right now we're making it easy to get high and hard to get treatment, and we need to make it easy to get treatment and hard to get high, and it everything we do should follow that mantra, and. And candidly, the last four years, we've not, I'm trying not to be political here, but the last four years, oh, it's quite that's all right. not what we were doing. Not no, what go we're get doing. political, Robert. It's okay. It's fine with me. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I mean, there's, we make choices. We make choices every two to four years. And there's, yeah. pe- okay. Okay. Let, let, let me get into this because let, let's double back to this because I also want to talk about harm reduction because I'm not. I'm not into what a lot of things that I see happening in Canada with handing out the crack pipes, handing out the meth pipes. This, this to me is all bullshit. Okay, but let's let's talk about some politics here. Uh, that border, Robert. We've done shows with former Border Patrol agent who testified in front of Congress last week, J.J. Carroll. That border has been opened. That can of worms has been opened. And I, I'm glad we're going to have a guy now who's serious about it. You open that border, Robert, these Mexican cartels have flooded this country. China has worked with them to flood this country. I want to double back to this. And, and if you want to get political, go ahead. And, and, but that and, open and, border, that open border is a disaster. And, and, and let me talk to um, uh, my friends on the left. And, and people uh, on the left here, and, and I know you two know some of those folks in the Hollywood. I spend a lot of time with them. 
And there's a lot of people who don't understand how illegal immigration, people crossing illegally, directly ties to fentanyl. There's a direct tie. Um, the fentanyl is what's killing the people. And occasionally a person that comes across the border kills somebody too, but it, fentanyl's killing way more people than theirs. So how do they interrelate? Let me make it as simple as B. Let's go, let's take a very high end concept and take it down to eighth grade. Three ways how illegal immigration directly leads to fentanyl deaths. One, people are asked to bring it across. So a coyote doing uh, services to get you across the border says, I'll discount your trip if you take these across. Or if you take these across, this will be your price. So they're literally or having it put in the bag because fentanyl is so small now. You know, it's not like Coke where you need, you know, caravans and Ford trucks and 53 foot semis. You can just have a person carry it across and you can get thousands of hits out of that. So one is just that whoever is illegally crossing, we give it to them. That's number one. Number two is, and we have a little graphic in our, our movie about it, where it's the old student body left, where we flood a zone. Like I live down in the, the uh, border area here in Texas. So s remember the cartels are doing, they have all these business verticals. They're doing drugs, uh, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, coyote services, and fentanyl. So they have five major products. So they'll flood a zone with people. And the reason why you flood it with people, people take a lot of work. It's processing, it's incarceration, due process. You got to go through all that. So it ties up people. So it ties up the federal agents, but it also in our state ties up the state uh, and the local. And so that group gets, gets sort of into one zone. Say everybody comes across in Laredo. So you have to pull people from McAllen, the Brownsville, the El Paso sector to take that. And then suddenly that sector, you can just walk across with fentanyl. We got video of people just walking fentanyl across because the other zone got flooded. So that's number two. And then number three, this is how it interrelates to the northern border. We have people, agents on the northern border who are on a computer processing people in the southwest border. And so that way we can say somebody's on the border but they're literally on their computer eight hours a day processing people via Zoom. They, they have a different, they have a, a secured network. It's not Zoom, but a Zoom-like product. And they process eight or nine people a day in paperwork. And they're on the northern border in their office, but they're not patrolling the sector. And so now we've left our northern flank because we now have people having to deal with the southwest border. And that's not to cut in. And I remind everybody, Canadian-U.S. border is the longest border in the world it, between huh? any two countries, uh, United States and Canada. Yep. And that doesn't even count Alaska. I always got to remember the Alaska to Canadian border. And all you have to do is get into uh, Anchorage, and then you're flying domestically, and you don't get all those checks that you do that you go international. So that's how the three ways the illegal immigration directly ties to fentanyl deaths. Well, also, I'll tell you what, I grew up on the border in a, a, a town called Buffalo, New York, and it's a border town. You look right across the river, there's Canada. And, you know, it's Niagara funny. Niagara Falls uh, area. In Niagara there. Falls. Yeah, yeah. And, and, oh, please, you barely had to. <laughs> when I was growing up, you bring the car down to about two miles an hour and you wave to the guy and they let you in. It was very like, come on in, come on in, go back. Uh, but, but here's the thing. <laughs> That you have this great illustration in your film that, you know, that where you talk, it, it, it illuminates the entire border and, and the gentleman talks about it as it goes all the way. We have relied on the good graces of our good relationship with Canada. Thank God, by the way, because, because look, at least we're not being invaded from Canada. But, you know, we've we've been fortunate for a long time that Canada is not going to allow the United States to be invaded the way Mexico is has allowed it, our country to be invaded. But what has happened now is, is this drug is so tiny and you can kill so many people with so little of it um, that even the Canadian border, Robert, is a, is a major issue now. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about that and how if you get into Puerto Rico, get into Guam, get into Alaska, 
Now you're in our system and it's a lot easier to get across. That's why Canada is supplying Australia and New Zealand now so much because you're in the Great Britain system. And so then you get you get less checks. And we have a person from the Canadian legislature on talking about Canada. And and she scares me. She says only 1% of the cargo coming in from Asia is checked. Less than 1% is what she has. And, and even with that, they're getting tons of precursors, cursors, and product of fentanyl. And so we got to get serious about all our borders. And that's why I'm so excited about Donald Trump is he's, he is, he is so focused on the border and, and our last team just like, didn't care. In fact, if you may remember for two or three years, they were like, it wasn't a problem. And the only reason they got some action was because it became a political problem. It wasn't a substance problem to them. It was a political problem to them. And then they got engaged you know, day late, dollar short. Um, but we got to get, we have to know what's coming across our border. We absolutely well, they, yeah. have to know what's coming across our well, border. Well, they, look, they, they threw it open, Robert. We've talked about this and they threw it open for a reason. I think it was, I think it was to change the voting in, in the United States and change the demographics of the country. And it was very perverse and a real Democrat would never have done it. JFK would never have done it. Bill Clinton, 92, never would have done it. I've said this a thousand times. Uh, Susan, your thoughts? Well, let's say that, you know, we, we do have these things called globalists who do not want this country to exist. And they want to destroy America. And when you have globalists infiltrating the current administration, and using them as puppets, I'm sorry, but you can't help but look at what's been happening and think, yeah, we know China wants to kill us, but we have our own government wanting to do that as well. And opening up that border was just saying, take it. And and I think there's a reason why Donald Trump did so well with Hispanics. And I, 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 I don't know, I haven't studied as much in California, but I know in Texas, Donald Trump carried almost every single border town, every single county. And think about this. These are counties that don't have a Republican Party. They have a Democrat Party, but they don't even have a Republican Party. And and I work a lot down in Laredo, in Harlingen, in McAllen area. And I was going through neighborhoods, and there'd be at least for every single block, there'd be a Trump flagged out like, you know, swag and and flags and lights and such and they were saying to to me and they're going we see the but we're the ground zero we're two miles in and we're yeah. dealing with this drugs coming across we're dealing with the cartels and they were they were the ones saying that 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 you know biden and and harris weren't taking care of business and so That's right. it this is not an ethnic racial this should be a common sense. This really shouldn't even be yes. political. It should yeah. be, do we want a safe border and know what and who is coming across? It should be yeah. that simple, and we're not doing yeah. it. Right, Robert, it's I've not s- right and left. It's right and wrong. Right and wrong, yeah. And, you know, I've said this to Susan on the show a number of times. I said, look, Robert, you'll appreciate this We continue where you live. If, if, if there's an elite attitude that like, oh, you're Mexican-American, you must be OK with this open border. 50% of L.A.'s cops, OK, are Latino, for lack of a better word, OK? 50%. Firemen in the military working their ass off every day to make it in America. They're Americans. If you think that Mexican-Americans want the border disaster, you don't know any Mexican-Americans. That's all. Uh, you just don't. You, you, uh, I think there's a lot of lefties who look at them as their pets and think that they know what's good for them. And no, they don't want to live with this, this, this invasion, Robert. And, and, but I want to say this. I want to say one thing about Mexico real quick. This country sucks up most of the world's drugs. Okay, We love drugs. We're drunks. We love drugs. That's it. We're Americans. It's the way it is. We, we Maybe it's just the curse of living as high as we live. We got to get high. But I want to say this, Robert, that does not excuse our appetite for drugs. To me, you can tell me I'm full of shit. It's okay. To me, our appetite for drugs 
does not excuse what Mexico has allowed to happen. And, and when, you know, I say this in the movie at a couple points, we got to do all of the above. We got to get serious about China, like real serious. We got to go after the cartels in Mexico. We got to go after the biker gangs in Canada. We have to go after the gangs in the United States. Like Chicago has a real gang problem. They're starting to buy pill presses and do their own work. Uh, you know, and, is, and I guarantee you, is if, as we shut down the southwest border, the northern border is going to come more, and then we'll shut that down, and then it's going to be inside. Uh, we have a deal where we interviewed the, uh, uh, we got a clip of an interview connected to Reuters, where Reuters went online and for $3,600 got all the precursors, the agents, the chemicals, the ingredients, including the mask and everything in a simple pill press, and were able to get enough product, mostly by Amazon, mostly uh, open market, and were able to able to have, uh, they could, uh, if they, they did right up to the making, because they didn't want to violate the law, but $4 million of product. Yeah. And you're like, for $3,600. And so we we got to do all of the above, but your point about United States right now, United States consumes roughly thirty eight percent of the fentanyl worldwide, and and that's down a little bit because other countries are starting to consume more. But pretty much every illicit drug since PCP in nineteen eighty three, PCP, angel dust, meth, uh, coke, crack, yeah, I mean, go through it all, K two spice, everything. United States generally ends up around 30 to 40 percent of consumption of every single drug that we've seen, illicit drug. And we got to also address that, too. But it does, you're exactly right. That doesn't get you a get out of fee pass for the cartels in Mexico or what's happening in Canada or China. That's Susan. why. Well, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Susan, does that scare you to think like if you look at like, see, the drug methamphetamine completely passed me by. OK, it was never a part of my my experience. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> you, loved it. <laughs> you loved it. OK, I, it, it passed me by. But what I'm it's saying is, doesn't it, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't it concern you, though, that like that the domestic production and the synthesis of this, Susan, will become an American phenomenon like we have meth labs. I lived next yeah. to a guy in Burbank in a really nice place. One day I came home, he had blown the place up. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but now we're going to have domestic production of fentanyl, Susan. Think about that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah and, and then and this, this may not be related, so forgive me if I'm going off track, but even when it comes to our legal, normal, medicinal drugs, they're all being produced in China. Uh, we don't we don't make antibiotics. So whenever China wants to poison us, or just gosh, there there was um an an ADD drug like an Adderall shortage, just like at the beginning of spring or something, and and people were losing their minds because they couldn't get what they needed, and. They're waiting for it to come in from China. Robert, you've served very high in this government. So I'm going to ask you something based on what Susan just said. You know, I, I think about China owning farmland. This is a broader question. China owning farmland near our, our military facilities. To me, see, that to me is not capitalism. That's prostitution. Okay. And I'm starting to really be worried about whether... You know, I've been reading Peter Schweitzer's books about all the influence that China has and the, the dealings, the, the money flowing between both, you know, congressmen and senators and, and politicians and lobbyists. Do you think this country can handle China honestly? You know what I mean? Like the, the business of all of this. Can we really crack down on them? Uh, and and what, what do you think of all this? And, and ultimately, you got to make China hurt financially to make them want to do it. And I think that's what President Trump's doing with the tariffs. Oh, I think he has the balls. About. Oh, Robert, yeah. he has yeah. the balls. Yeah. He and has so, the balls to do it. And, and the last four years, we haven't had anybody. I, I went to China as part of this movie, to sh and, and, and I spent two and a half uh, weeks in China. I went to all the major cities, went all over, and 
It's striking that in China, you don't see anybody on fentanyl. It's very seriously cracked down there. They, they can make it where you don't. I, I went to nine of the top 15 biggest cities. I went to rural. I went everywhere, went uh, Hong Kong, Macau. I went, went everywhere. And I saw a total of four people the entire two and a half weeks that were on some drug or another. That, that was it, four people, the total. I see four people out my window every time I go to a hotel in San Francisco, and that's only because my shades are closed. It get, you, you walk outside of San Francisco, the whole block is done. And so China knows how to make sure they don't use the drugs, and they have the power to control that and, and help the world. But as long as they think it can keep hurting and keep destroying and create chaos while they're making billions of dollars, that, you know, I still think the motivation is money. I, I, I think that's the motivation, but it's an extra benefit that it messes up our country. Yeah. It's almost like they don't care about messing up the country, but it's money. And certainly the Mexican cartels, this was all about money. And now Canada biker gangs, this is all about money. And so we got to, we have an existential threat. We've never had this many people dying of anything. And so we need to get our act together right now before it's over. Uh, I, we're going to lose a whole generation unless we get serious like now. Uh, we can't wait. The thing I see on the street, I have not met anybody who's a fentanyl addict that's done fentanyl more than 18 months. That's sort of the outer edge. Most of the time it's eight or nine months because sooner or later you're going to take that one pill that has a little extra and you die or you misjudge it and you die. And you, you know, you talked about Narcon. I think there's this really bad perception out there that Narcon's going to save us from this. And that's why we have that Dr. Morris, the, the famous doctor up from Alaska is on their mental health board. And he goes, if you keep taking fentanyl, you're going to lose two or three percent of your brain every time you, you get a Narcon hit. It, it's like having a stroke or a heart attack. You go two, two minutes without oxygen to your brain. And this idea that we can keep narconing, and I have meet people on the street who regularly have been hit 30 times, 35 times, and their brain is mush. And it, it is the far left in the harm reduction crowd is making you feel like Narcon will make this easy. And sorry, Susan, I know well, you were- No, because I'm, I'm against it now. Yeah. No, I've reformed. It, and and, no. and we got to realize that if you get hit that many times, your brain is mush. Well, yeah. wait, 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 wait. Let's be clear. When you say get hit, you mean be given Narcon so many yeah, times? Yeah, Narcon. So, so you're Narcon out with so fentanyl. many times that you, okay, yeah, I got you. Yeah, so you're out on fentanyl, and what fentanyl does is it paralyzes your chest cavity, so you're not breathing. So you you don't have a pulse, and you don't breathing. So you're down, you're flat, and they hit uh, with Nar Narcan. And by the way, on the street, when I was early into this, Narcon worked most of the time. Um, I, I was out with Billy Baldwin the other day up in Seattle and a guy got hit that we hit him three times and, and he finally came back, but he was out for two minutes, heart rate gone for two minutes, I, I, you know, breathing gone for two minutes. And so this is not going to be an easy deal if we keep saying, oh, Narcon's going to take care of it and we'll do it. Well, you know, Robert, you know Americans, and if you tell them this pill will make everything okay, they'll believe it. If Whether it's weight loss or Narconon's going to save you, no matter how many fucking times you take it, Americans, they'll just go along with it. I, I hope they don't. But let's, I want to touch on harm reduction real quick because I think this is absolutely crazy. And then I want to conclude by talking about your work in, in homelessness uh, because yeah, this I, is this is a parallel, but, it, but uh, harm reduction, Robert. I'm sorry, this government should not. And Trudeau's government in Canada, God's sake, you're handing out people crack pipes and meth pipes. You think you're helping? You think you're yeah. helping? Or it, even clean needles? It's not. It's it, not. I'm sorry. It's not working. It's not it, working. And 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 I know we only got about 11 minutes left, but let let's let's go right into harm reduction in simplest way. Harm reduction says 
we can make fentanyl safe and make the supply of fentanyl safe. This is the most dangerous, powerful drug. It's a hundred times more powerful than morphine. That's 10,000% more powerful than morphine. You can't make it safe. And in San Francisco, when we did our homeless uh, documentary movie, the San Francisco uh, city council and county government had their health authority providing a safe consumption site a block and a half from City Hall, right next to the FBI and DEA building, in a tinted area, a mesh put out, and they spent $28 million a year to do it, and people are still dying. And 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 we we cover harm reduction. I encourage people to go watch, you know, uh, Fentanyl Death Incorporated on Salem dot uh, SalemNow dot com, and you'll see we talk about this in in San Francisco. More than any place is nuts. They're now giving. I think last I saw, they voted five million dollars for alcohol for alcoholics. Oh and, yes, and, yes. And, and then they did. Tenders. They did 28 million for this, quote, safe consumption. There is nothing safe about consuming fentanyl. No, no, no. When you're you, no. when you're allergic to facts, when you're allergic to facts, you you get San Francisco. Uh Susan, <laughs> let, let's that is Susan, so right. let's let's Susan, let's talk about this. I'm just gonna be real brief uh because I want to wrap up. But Susan, give your thoughts on homelessness. I'm gonna give mine. Robert. This city of Los Angeles was spending a billion dollars, a billion, one city, a billion with a B on fixing homelessness. No one knows where the money goes. They're probably up to $2 billion now. Sleeping in a tent is okay. Uh, we don't have any money. I would have mental hospitals and treatment facilities. There would be more. If you gave me a billion dollars, there would be more treatment facilities than Starbucks. But they don't know where the hell the money went. The money evaporates. And everybody says, oh, we just need to spend more. This is a complete, complete disaster. This state is a disaster. So I want to get your thoughts on homelessness, but Susan, that's my rant. Uh, you take it from there and we'll give it to Ron. Well, and and I'm sorry, but, you know, where did the money go? We have very, very corrupt people running this state. And I think it's pretty darned obvious. And um, I, I'm not completely convinced that, that, that the people of California are really stupid enough to keep voting for them, but it seems like it. Um, there's also the, the the attitude seems to be throw money, just throw money at it. Don't get your hands dirty. Don't actually engage. Just throw money at the situation. And um, you know, when it comes to getting somebody getting their life together, yes, like okay, we we closed down the mental hospitals because a lot of them were horrible. That wasn't necessarily the answer, but the answer isn't for them to have nowhere to go. They need places to go. They need places to live. And they need incentives to make their own lives better. And, and there's this old saying that I can't get enough of. It says, when you give a man something he hasn't earned, you take away a piece of his soul. You have to get these people on, on, on the road to being rewarded for their own recovery and being responsible for themselves. In, in homelessness, here's some real quick facts. 75% of the people experiencing street-level homelessness have an untreated mental illness and a substance abuse co-presenting that's self-medicating. That's just national fact. Don't let anybody tell you. And where I get that from is California Policy Lab, which is UC Berkeley, UCLA. Not a not a right-wing Robert Marbet think tank or discovery. This is a left-wing. So if that's your problem, treatment is your, your, your goal. But we have a thing in the homelessness world called Housing First, which is an extreme form of harm reduction. It basically says, we'll give you a house, we'll give you gas cards, we'll give you food, we'll give you clothes. And if you want to come in for treatment, let us know, give us a ring and we'll do it. But we're going to give you free stuff. And ask and for nothing. And ask and you do not and ask worked. for nothing. Yeah. It's and ask not for worked. Nothing. We're spending three times more money than we have, and we're now doubling every five years. Now, think about this. If we did house homelessness, or, or, or let's flip it on its head. If we did 
Pell Grants, the way we did Housing First, you would say, we'll send you a check of 7000 per semester, every semester. You don't have to go to school. You don't <laughs> have to get grades. You don't ever have to graduate. And if you do, and if, and by the way, if you get arrested, do some other things, you actually get a bump in your, your, your money because you're considered at risk or, or, or at need. And we, we would never do that with our Pell Grant system. We would never do that with TANF. We would never do that with our unemployment insurance. But somehow on Housing First and Homeless, we say we treat you, and it's really, to your point, Susan, it's treating you, quote, as a victim rather than mm-hmm. empowering you to get out. What we need is more treatment facilities for mental health and substance abuse, and we need to have work work programs built into it. Because in the end of the day, if you don't have a job, you can't afford to pay for your rent. You can't afford to pay for your food. So those are the three things we should be doing and not giving away free stuff and saying, you know what, this didn't work. We just need more. And I'll remind you that President Obama and and Biden in, uh, in 2013 said, and also in 2010, they said it too, that they would end homelessness by setting up Housing First as the official policy of the country. They would end veteran homeless, family homeless, chronic homeless, all by 2018. And, and, and none of that's happened at all. And what they have said now is we need more money. So they've tripled the amount of money and it's made it worse, not better. Yeah. And I will conclude with this. I understand, my understanding is in the state of California, you can't even ask for a sobriety standard. Like you can't say, oh, well, you know, come pee in a cup and we're going to give you a place. You can't even ask for sobriety. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, listen, it's been a great hour. Robert, uh, we can find the film uh, Fentanyl, uh, fentanyl, uh, excuse me, Death Incorporated. Fentanyl, yeah, Death, fentanyl Incorporated. Death Incorporated. For God's sake, go to SalemNow.com. You can watch it for like seven bucks. You can buy it for 10 bucks. Uh, Robert, where will, how will the film be rolled out? Tell us where we find it, where we find the film. So right right now, uh, uh, SalemNow.com uh, is the best way and you can get in in about 90 seconds. You'll be watching it. And then in January, uh, Warner Brothers has picked it up for broader distribution and we'll go into it. Right now, we're in like a pre-screening uh, marketing promotion. And then in January, we'll be up on other platforms. But right now, um, and it's a great time. I, I think it's an, such an important subject that this should be talked about at the Thanksgiving dinner table. And we need to be talking about it, not avoiding it. Absolutely. Susan, your final thoughts? I couldn't agree with you more. Talk about it. Yeah. Even Indeed. if it offends, and, and this isn't an offensive thing. I think everybody, no matter what side they're on, they, they can agree. That, you know, this, these fentanyl deaths are bad, and and these people need help. Absolutely. And not, not just you know help thrown at them, like you know, yep. they need caring, real help. All right. There he is, uh, Robert Marbot. Thank you so much for joining us on The Crusher today. Uh, We're absolutely honored to have you here. And everybody go check out Fentanyl Death Incorporated. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so very much for having us. Really appreciate it. We appreciate you. Thank you for doing the work. 